Okay, so um, in this paper, I want to provide an account of uh, Deleuze and Guattari's model of the rhizome, and also to look at a possible Hegelian line of response to it. I also want to look at Hegel's description of plant life in the philosophy of nature, and to see whether this can provide a Hegelian riposte to the deleuze guattarian model of thought. So in this first section, I want to look at why Deleuze feels that we need to move away from a classical conception of thinking, typically tied to the structure of judgment. So while Deleuze's critique of judgment uh, occurs throughout his work, I want to focus here on the arguments offered in his collaborations with Guattari in particular, and uh, with A Thousand Plateaus. Because it's here that Deleuze and Guattari introduce the, uh, the notion of rhizomatic thought as an alternative to what they characterise as the image of the world. Uh, this image they call either the tree or the root book. In order to understand why Deleuze and Guattari feel the need to introduce the concept of a rhizome, we need to first understand the limitations of the classical model of thought uh, which they wish to oppose. So Deleuze and Guattari's discussion of traditional model, the traditional model of thought in A Thousand Plateaus centres on two limitations. First, the classical model of thought is imitative. Their point is that insofar as the classical image forms a complete and unified image of the world, it necessarily leads us to posit a radical dualism between the image of thought and the world, <coughs> and the world of which it's an image. That is, we're led to posit two different ontological planes, a position which cuts off the possibility of the kind of imminent and univocal ontology uh, which Deleuze and Guattari want to construct. So the world and the image of the world become two distinct entities which cannot be reconciled with each other. And they say, uh, how could the law of the book reside in nature uh, when it's what presides over the very distinction between the world and book, nature and art? So that's the first criticism. The second criticism of classical logic, uh, as well as the arborescent or root metaphors that characterise it, is that they presuppose a moment of unity, as well as a binary division of this primary unity. So it operates according to a process of division. So they talk about the law of the one that becomes two, then the two that become four. The classical example of this kind of thought would be the arbor porphyriana, porphyry's tree of species. The essential idea which underlies this model is that by the division of a more general category by a difference, uh, we're able to give a precise account of what something is. That is, we gradually approach a more precise definition of something by further adding properties to it which differentiate it from other entities. So here's a quote from Porphyry where he discusses this. He says, uh, in each category there are the highest classes, the lowest classes, and some which are between the highest and the lowest. There is a highest genus beyond which there can be no superior genus. <coughs> there is a lowest species after which there can be no subordinate species. And between the highest genus and the lowest species, there are some classes which are genera and species at the same time, since they are comprehended in relation to the highest genus and the lowest species. Let us make the meaning clear with reference to one category. Substance is itself a genus. Under this is body, under body, animate body, under which is animal, under animal is rational animal, under which is man, under man are Socrates, Plato and particular men. Okay, so the first difficulty with such an approach is that it creates a sharp distinction between nature and the image of nature. Porphyry's hierarchy of terms operates according to sharply opposed differences, but it appears that in nature we have more gradated distinctions between different objects. So Porphyry writes that opposed differences do not mix, but opposed accidents may mix. This difficulty, in fact, stems from a deeper problem, the need to explain both aberrant cases where the entity falls within a species without having the property that's supposed to govern species membership, and differences which are not taken into account when we consider what a thing is. So on the one hand, we need an account of the fact that some men are not rational but still are to be counted as men. Uh, on the other, we need to deal with the fact that men may differ in inessential properties, 
without this affecting their nature as men. In order to deal with these questions, we need to make a distinction between what is essential to something and what properties that thing has merely accidentally. Such a distinction seems to require a further ontological dichotomy, however, between the image of the thing, its essence, and its actual worldly and often imperfect state. The dichotomy between essence and appearance therefore leads to the distinction between the image of the world as essence and the world itself as appearance. Okay, so indifference and repetition, Deleuze calls for two conditions that must be fulfilled when we, when we make a judgment. He argues that the subject must possess both good sense and common sense. Deleuze defines good sense and common sense as follows. He says, uh, while common sense is the norm of identity from the point of view of the pure self and the form of the unspecified object which corresponds to it, good sense is the norm of distribution from the point of view of empirical selves and objects qualified as this or that kind of thing, which is why it is considered to be universally distributed. So if these two problems, the problem of the accidental and essential properties, is one of good sense. It amounts to the ability to attribute, attribute predicates appropriately and to correctly assign things their positions within the hierarchy. <coughs> Thus problems of good sense occur when we have difficulties in knowing when to attribute a property to something and when not to, such as in the degenerate cases which Aristotle discovers in the parts of animals. <clears throat> so he says that the sea anemones or sea nettles, as they are variously called, are not testacea at all, but lie outside the recognised groups. Their constitution approximates on the one side to plants and on the other side to animals. So in these cases, the possibility of successfully making a judgement is thrown into doubt by a purely empirical question of whether or not a particular entity belongs to the species in question. Good sense is not the sole presupposition of judgment, however, and it's the case that even with the failure of good sense, judgment is still intact. So Deleuze says, it's as though error were a kind of failure of good sense within the form of common sense that remains integral and intact. Rather than simply address the grounds for good judgment, Deleuze's project is to examine the grounds for judgment in general. Even when the subject exhibits poor judgment, or when good sense fails, we're still dealing with thought in terms of a hierarchy of terms. The subject falls into error by subsuming the particular under the wrong universal, or failing to recognise the essential difference. Okay. So Deleuze's criticism of common sense instead attacks the nature of judgment itself. Judgment involves the attribution of a predicate to a subject. And Deleuze follows Kant in claiming that such attribution relies on the notion of a pure subject and <coughs> transcendental object. This requires, prior to the attribution of properties themselves, a theory about what is to count as substance or individual. So prior to the specification of properties of a subject, Judgment already requires the subject to be individuated. In Deleuze and Guattari's terminology, it's going to assume a certain kind of, of uh, territorialization. Okay, so if we look at the dichotomous approach, we discover that although it can provide an account of the qualification of a subject, it cannot provide an account of its constitution. At the top of the hierarchy, we simply have the notion of a being, albeit an empty one. And Deleuze writes that in order to arrive at two using the strong spiritual method, it must assume a strong principle unity. So in other words, the principle unity must always precede the determination of the object, ruling out an account of the emergence of this unity itself. On Deleuze's reading, there are therefore two principal implications for judgments. First, judgment presupposes that what exists is a world of objects, Second, judgment presupposes a certain distribution of objects throughout the world. This closes off the possibility of anything like a theory of the genesis of objectivity itself, or the formulation of an ontology that does not presuppose the division of the world into subjects and properties. Okay, so how are we to overcome these limitations? Deleuze and Guattari propose that rather than conceiving of thought on the model of a tree or a root, 
we need to develop a new form of thinking, in this case based on the model of the rhizome. Rather than a vertically branching structures, structure, rhizomes have stem systems that are horizontal in nature and not organised around a central point. Further, they have adventitious root systems, which means root systems do not simply develop from a specific part of the plantlet, but are also capable of developing from other parts of the plants, such as stems or leaves. Deleuze and Guattari argue that the rhizome provides a better model for thought as it does not require a central point, is not hierarchical, and allows heterogeneous connections between <coughs> parts to be formed. To see how this alternative model functions, it's worth looking at a system which is archetypally rhizomatic for Deleuze and Guattari, which is the wasp and the orchid. So Deleuze and Guattari refer to the Orphis genus of orchids, which attract wasps with a modified petal which resembles a female wasp. As the male wasp attempts to copulate with the petal, pollinia become attached to its body. And uh, Deleuze and Guattari write about this, that the line or block of becoming that unites the wasp and the orchid produce a shared deterritorialization of the wasp in that it becomes a liberated piece of the orchid's reproductive system, and also of the orchid in that it becomes the object of an orgasm in the wasp, also liberated from its own reproduction. So if we take this case, it would seem as if that if we were going to explain the symbiotic relationship between the wasp and the orchid on the model of judgment, we would have to presuppose some kind of unified centre for interaction. This amounts, in effect, to seeing one as the property of the, of the other. So the wasp purely is a property in the reproductive system of the orchid, or the orchid is a moment in the instinctual system of the wasp. Or seeing both as contained in some kind of higher unity. Deleuze and Guattari, however, argue that such an approach ultimately is going to be incapable of explaining the generation, not merely of an additive unity of two organisms, but of an entirely new system. So they say, whenever there is transcoding, we can be sure that there is not a simple addition, but the constitution of a new plane as of a surplus value, a melodic or rhythmic plane, surplus value of passage or bridging. In this sense... They want to see the wasp orchid as, orchid as what they call an assemblage, not as the mere addition or simple exchange between two different organisms, but as the constitution of a whole new, wholly new system defined purely in terms of the manifold of relations that it exhibits. The constitution of a new and open system cannot be understood within the arborescent framework, since such frameworks can only <coughs> account for determination of a pre-existing subject rather than the constitution of a novel one. The rhizomatic approach resonates even more closely with uh, Margulis' seminal study of cellular biology, which is a symbiosis in cell evolution. Uh, here Margulis argues that eukaryotic cells, which are cells containing a uh, complex of organelles, evolve through the symbiotic relationships of more primitive prokaryotic cells. So the basic elements of the cells, such as mitochondria, migrated within cell membranes of other cells in order to form mutually beneficial relationships. Mitochondria allow the cell to use oxidizing relation, uh, reactions to produce energy, while the cell provides the machinery for reproduction of my mitochondria. Such an approach breaks with the idea of progressive differentiation of lineages of organisms by recognizing the importance of transversal communication of genetic data between species. So we don't just have a you know, kind of top-down approach, but we have genetic information jumping over between different branches uh, in this kind of account. It therefore disrupts the hierarchical model which judgment relies upon by showing that organisms are not to be understood purely as subsumed under species, but also as forming parallel connective relationships. This move away from a subsumptive logic further opens the possibility that rather than seeing properties as attached to a pre-existing logical sub subject, we can see organisms as essentially open. So Margulis's account is not one of the development of the organism or the determination of the subject of predication, but of the constitution of the organism itself, which is the emergence of the subject of predication. <coughs> 
Okay, so Deleuze's introduction of the rhizome is therefore intended to overcome several limitations of arborescent thought. First, it's intended to provide a logic capable of accounting for the genesis of a particular system. It does this by not relying on the notion of a subject as pre-existing its determination. Second, it aims at providing a logical capa logic capable of explaining transversal connections between systems. Rhizomatic thought will therefore dispense with two interrelated moments of the structure of judgment. First, it will not be based on the notion of attachments of properties to a central identity. Second, it will not rely on subsumption. Subsumption is key to the structure of judgment as it allows a subject to be determined by the constant restriction of logical space it's found in. But symbiotic relationships, for instance, disrupt this procedure by creating bridges between different logical spaces. The eukaryotic cell belongs to two lineages and hence two arborescent spaces simultaneously. It occurs on two branches of the tree of life at the same time. In order to provide a way of understanding the world which does not rely on the linear determination of judgment, the rhizome must therefore be conceived of what Deleuze called an a-centered, non-hierarchical, non-signifying system without a general and without an organizing memory or central automaton. Okay, so what's the central logical move that Deleuze makes in putting forward this project? It's going to be the substitution of a logic based on the copula by a logic based on conjunction. So he says, uh, the tree imposes the verb to be, but the fabric of the rhizome is the conjunction and, and, and. In fact, there are going to be two senses in which <coughs> the verb to be is rejected by Deleuze. First, Deleuze rejects the predicative use of to be, thus moving away from a subsumptive understanding of determination. He also rejects the second sense of to be, the affirmation of an identity, or A is A. In order to escape from this use of to be, Deleuze and Guattari need to focus on relations between terms rather than the terms themselves. Okay, so in this account so far, we've seen some of the key features of Deleuze's critique of judgment. Uh, if we return momentarily to difference of repetition, however, we can see that Deleuze is quite careful in making a distinction between classical logic, which he calls finite representation, and Hegelian dialectic, which he calls infinite representation. Hegel himself is quite hostile to the idea that judgment should be the driving force in philosophy. He argues, however, against the idea that, and this is a quote from Hegel, the inadequacy of the finite categories to express truth entails the impossibility of objective cognition. <coughs> so Hegel therefore put forward what he calls the speculative proposition. Whereas the two senses of the term to be are kept separate in finite thought, in the sense that this rose is a rose, is logically different in kind to the judgment this rose is red, Hegel's speculative proposition attempts to combine identity and predicative uses of to be in the same proposition. For Hegel as well as Deleuze, classical judgments rely on what Hegel calls a passive subject which constitutes the basis to which content is attached and upon which the movement runs back and forth. By contrast, in the speculative proposition, the subject is related to another subject, as in the proposition, the actual is universal. In this case, Hegel argues that although both terms are subjects, and hence relate themselves to themselves through the proposition, we do not have a simple tautology, as the two terms are not identical to one another. As the speculative proposition cannot be understood by asserting the identity of two terms, or predicating one of the other, finite thought fails to make sense of the proposition. For infinite or dialectical thought, the speculative proposition represents the heart of the dialectical method, however, as the reiteration of the second subject, in this case the universal, as both different and identical to the first subject, which is the actual, forces thought to consider the subject itself no longer as a fixed identity, but as something which is itself changed by the movement of the proposition. As, as the second subject is not simply a further determination, but rather the subject itself, the whole proposition is put into motion. <coughs> 
And uh, Hegel expresses it as follows. He says, formally what has been said can be expressed thus. Uh, the general nature of the judgment or proposition, which involves the distinction of subject and predicate, is destroyed by the speculative proposition. And the proposition of identity, which the former becomes, contains the counterthrust against the subject predicate relationship. Okay, so while Deleuze is careful to distinguish Hegel from other thinkers of representation, he argues that every philosophy of categories takes judgment for its model, as we see in the case of Kant, or even in the case of Hegel. So that is, in spite of Hegel's attempt to move away from the concept of judgment, the speculative proposition is still too close to the form of judgment to provide the kind of analysis uh, or account that Deleuze thinks that we need. So I don't want to explore Deleuze's critique of Hegel here, but rather reflect on Hegel's own discussion of conjunctive logic in the philosophy of nature and the science of logic. Uh, the aim is to see whether it's possible to formulate a Hegelian riposte to the move to a rhizomatic model of thought. Okay. So, whereas the science of logic attempts to provide the complete determination of the categories of thought and being, Hegel's philosophy of nature expresses these ideas as they're found in the world itself. Nature is, according to Hegel, the idea in the form of otherness. Whereas the science of logic discovers reason to be a coherent, internally related whole, nature for Hegel embodies what he calls the unreason of externality. While externality constitutes the specific character in which nature as nature exists, and that's a quote from Hegel, the philosophy of nature charts the movement of reason back into the form of a unity with spirit in the form of what he calls a path of return. And he says, for it is that which overcomes, for it is that which overcomes the division between nature and spirit and assures to spirit its knowledge of its essence in nature. The philosophy of nature will therefore chart the movement from the pure externality of the parts to a form where the parts are once again understood according to internal relations. Much as we found in the case of Deleuze, these categories will not merely allow for a descriptive analysis of nature. Nature embodies the categories of thought, albeit in a different element, and on this basis there's going to be a normative character to Hegel's descriptions of the natural world. Different forms of life will better embody the idea, and so his appraisals of the sophistication of different forms of life will allow us to determine his appraisals of the form of logic that they embody. As Hegel's philosophy aims to provide a purely imminent description of the world, which does not rely on any external principles, the movement from the pure externality of nature back to the idea of internal relationality given by the end of the logic must be itself an imminent process. So that, it, that is, it can't rely on any principles outside of itself. So, therefore, Hegel's account attempts to show how nature itself moves from a system governed by externality to one governed by internal relations. Hegel's dialectic attempts to show how spirit gradually becomes embodied in more and more adequate forms, uh, progressing through mechanism, physics, chemistry to life, and finally to the apex of life, which is man. In the process, we move from an understanding of the world governed purely by the self-externality of matter to one which is centred on a far more Aristotelian view of the organism as a relation of parts to a whole, where, and this is a quote from Hegel, he says, insofar as the animal's members are simply moments of its form and are perpetually negated in their independence and withdrawing into a unity which is the reality of the notion, the animal is an existent idea. If a finger is cut off, a process of chemical decomposition sets in and it is no longer a finger. So while, the ani while animal life provides the model of the highest form of organisation, plant life occupies a position similar to the rhizome in Deleuze and Guattari's account. Taking rhizomes in <coughs> particular, Hegel writes that uh, strawberries and a number of other plants, as we know, put out runners, i.e. creeping stalks, which grow out of the root. 
These filaments or leaf stalks form nodes. If these points touch the earth, they in turn put out roots and produce new, complete plants. So much like Deleuze, Hegel's point here is that the rhizome does not have a fixed and determinate structure, such as we find in what Hegel calls the higher plants. Rather, differentiation is always provisional and not formed around the unity of the plant as a whole. We should note here, however, that Hegel recognises that even the higher plants exhibit the same structural features which we find in the lower plants. For Hegel, the distinction is not going to be between the rhizome and the root and tree, but between the plant and the animal. It's plant life as a whole which exhibits a structure which escapes from the hierarchical form criticised by Deleuze. Thus, immediately after providing the example of the rhizome, Hegel introduces the example of the mangrove tree, where, and this is a quote, a single tree will cover the moist banks of rivers and lakes for a mile or more with a forest consisting of numerous trunks which meet at the top like close-clipped foliage. In what sense, therefore, is Hegel's conception of the plant to be compared with Deleuze's conception of the rhizome? Well, in both cases, we have systems without a central point of unity which do not operate according to the binary logic of direction which governs the structure of judgment. So whereas the animal form lacks a natural unity with each part internally related well the animal forms a natural unity, sorry with each part internally related to each other the plant lacks what Hegel calls a soul and forms merely external relations between parts. Whereas the body of the animal is an organised body the plant, says Hegel, has not at the same time acquired a system of viscera. The lack of a central unity means that each part of the organism can be connected with each other. And for Hegel, this is another quote from Hegel, the difference of the organic parts is only a superficial metamorphosis, and one, car- one part can easily assume the function of the other. Therefore, rather than having parts inhering in the unity of a whole, we have for Hegel a system where there is no longer any distinction between parts and wholes, or between subjects and properties. So he says, uh, in short, any part of the plant can exist as a complete individual. This can never be the case with animals, with the exception of the polyps and other quite undeveloped species of animals. Okay, so as we saw above, the classical differentiation of species occurs through a movement of division, with an object being determined through the attribution of a specific difference to a subject. As the plant does not have a central subject, it likewise escapes from the logic of opposition. Differences are no longer presented as oppositions governed by a central identity, as we found in the Arbor Porphyriana. It therefore appears as if the plant escapes from the kind of arborescent logic which Hegel criticises. Rather than operating through a logic of opposition and hierarchy, it operates linearly through a process of conjunction. As we shall see, Hegel argues however, that this conception of life necessarily collapses back into a model with a definite centre and an oppositional structure, as in the case of the organised body of animal life. Deleuze's focus on the rhizome implies an underlying logic, and this is also the case with Hegel's discussion of plant life. The philosophy of nature is an expression of reason in its externality, and so we can see it as correlated with the logical categories provided in the science of logic. The question, therefore, is which of the categories of the science of logic correspond to plant life? In this case, the dialectic which embodies the transition from plant life to animal life is the dialectic of the finite and the infinite. <coughs> okay, so I want to give just a brief account of that dialectic. Okay, so the dialectic of infinity occurs in the first part of the science of logic in the doctrine of being. As Hegel's dialectic proceeds imminently, we'll begin at the stage where the dialectic has reached the recognition that if something is to be seen as determinate, it must be related to something else. So Hegel argues that for something to be determinate, it must be constituted by relating to and being distinct from something else. In other words, it's going to be this rather than that. These two moments are the foundation of a distinction between being in itself and being for another, as it's going to be both self-enclosed as a this 
but also other related as a not that. We can first ask how this essential relation to another plays out in the determination of something. If something is to be determined by its relations to another, it should be the case that at least two conditions must be met. First, it must form some kind of relation to this other in order that determination can take place. Second, it must differ from this other, as without this difference there would be no other to determine it. So these two conditions imply a further concept, which is that of the limit, which will both separate the two some things, and yet as they share this limit will relate them to one another. The limit circumscribes what a thing is by defining the point at which it transitions into its other. But as such, the limit has a paradoxical quality. It's the ground for the existence of something, as something requires this relation and separation from the other, but it's also the point at which something no longer is. Something is what it is within its limit, and here we transition to another category. What is fundamental to the structure of something is this relation to its limit, but its limit is what it's not. The fundamental relationship towards its own negation leads us, according to Hegel, to recognise that at the heart of something is finitude. Finitude, therefore, sees the limit not as something merely indifferent, but rather as a fundamental moment in its structure. Without this limit, finitude would become infinitude. It would go beyond itself. And this is the first sense of the infinite as the pure beyond. The limit, therefore, acts to prevent the finite from becoming something other than itself. As we cannot at this stage countenance the possibility of the finite containing the infinite, the notion of limit does not simply signify an arbitrary point in something's relation to another something, but is also a limitation. It's that which prevents finitude from becoming infinite. So this brings a new moment into the concept of finitude. As finitude now contains limitation as well as limit, uh, we can say that it also brings in the notion that it ought to overcome this limitation. This ought captures the complex structure of finitude. It contains both its being and its limitation. In fact, these two moments are in tension. Finitude wants to transcend its limitation, but as the limitation is integral to finitude, it resists the force of this ought. As the moment of transcendence provided by the ought is integral to finitude, however, it does go beyond itself. So we have a constant pro process of the moving between two different moments. Finitude perishes because it transcends its limitation, but this perishing simply leads to the emergence of another moment of finitude, as the ought includes the moment of limitation within it. We therefore have a perpetual series of finite moments the perishing of one leading to the generation of the next. The series of finite moments, therefore, constitutes another form of the infinite, the infinite series. OK, so when we look at the notion of the infinite, we can see that it relies on its reference to the finite. It's specified as the beyond which escapes from the limitation of finitude. As a result of this, however, uh, the notion of limitation is inherent to the notion of the infinite as well. For this reason, the notion of the infinite is characterised by Hegel as the bad infinite, or the spurious infinite. The finite and the infinite are therefore, in fact, quite similar to each other. Both are defined by this common limitation, and each relies on the other to sustain itself. So each concept requires that the other be determinately understood, in order that it may itself become determinate. While we want to be able to be understand each category in its own terms, we find that each category leads us to consider the other. This leads us into another form of infinity, an infinite series which oscillates between these two terms, as each refers itself to the other in order to vouchsafe its own determinacy. There's thus an inherent unity between the two categories, although also a moment of difference, depending on the emphasis we place on the terms themselves. The infinite is determined in part by its differentiation from the finite, as such, however, it's tied to the notion of limit and thus to finitude. It's a finitized infinite. But the finite now has a definite structure. It's now no longer defined in terms of its orts. As such, it's an infinitized finite. 
Rather than these two terms being considered as defined in their own terms, we now explicitly recognise that finitude as a part of its structure has reference to infinity, and that the infinite likewise contains reference to the finite. These references mean that regardless of which term we begin with, we're driven to the other. Rather than seeing these terms as existing in a series, as was the case with the bad infinite, we now have explicitly recognised that they reciprocally determine each other, and we can see them as forming a circle. Thus, from the very structure of the infinite series of finite somethings, we're led to the notion that the finite and infinite are concepts which are mediated by one another. Neither can be determined independently of the other. Once we recognise this, we can note that the true infinite is this structure of movement itself uh, of the finite and the infinite as a whole. So the infinite for Hegel is ultimately going to be this process of movement between the finite and the infinite, the process as a whole. Okay, so now we can return to the question of how this notion of infinity is related to the notion of an a-centred, non-hierarchical mode of organisation. In Hegel's earlier Jena logic, he explicitly relates the question of the bad infinite to the question of the one and the many. He writes that the, subs the subsistence of the many qualities as of the many quanta has simply the beyond of a unity that has not yet been taken up into them and would sublate, sublate the subsistence if it was so taken up. Hegel's point, therefore, is that any mode of organisation which simply relies on a series of properties related without a central notion cannot but inter imminently develop under dialectical analysis a central moment of unity whereby the series presented by finitude is recognised as containing the infinite. So we can't have a many without the one dialectically emerging from it. Systems of organisation such as that proposed by Deleuze rely on an artificial suspension of this moment of unity. So Hegel says, in order to subsist, the aggregate is not allowed to take up this beyond into itself, but just as little can it free itself from it and cease to go beyond itself. On this reading, therefore, Deleuze's strategy would rely on an artificial suspension of the movement of the dialectic. If Deleuze were consistent, he would allow the non-hierarchical field to imminently develop a moment of central unity. Okay. So, the movement of the infinite is the key to understanding Hegel's account of life. The plant is explicitly characterised as an infinite conjunctive multiplicity, lacking any notion of a centre. So Hegel says, each plant is therefore only an infinite number of subjects, and the togetherness by which it appears as one subject is only superficial. The structure of the plant, therefore, is the expression of the bad infinite. As we saw with the structure of the of finitude, the infinite series of the bad infinite eventually showed itself to require a moment of unity, uh, which was provided by the recognition that in the good infinite, the determinations of the finite and the infinite uh, were reconciled, each moment preserving its determinacy. Deleuze brings forth the rhizome as an archetype of a system without a centrify, central unifying principle. Hegel, however, has an analysis of such a form of life that shows that it does have a central point of unity. So he says, the plant has an essential, infinite relationship with light. The simple principle of selfhood, which is outside of the plant, is the supreme power over it. Schelling therefore says, if the plant had consciousness, it would worship light as its god. The plant therefore manages to exist without an internal point of unity, only because it's alienated from its true moment of unity, which is light, which is external to it. It is only if we ignore this infinite relationship to light that we can see the plant as A-centred. What appears to be a non-hierarchical structure is in fact coordinated according to a point external to the plant, the plane of the plant's rhizomatic growth. So Hegel gives an example where he says, potato plants sprouting in a cellar creep from distances of several yards across the floor to the side where the light enters through a hole in the wall in order to reach the opening where they can enjoy the light. Okay. 
as Hegel writes uh, of the finite and the infinite in the science of logic, he says, if they are taken as devoid of connection with each other, they are only joined by and, and then each confronts the other as self-subsistent, as in its own self, only affirmatively present. Without the infinite providing a point of unity, there's no connection possible at all between the elements, and we're left with a hollow philosophy of the and, and, and. Okay, so the last section. Second to last section. <laughs> Hegel therefore, therefore puts forward a view of the rhizome which is fundamentally opposed to that of Deleuze, and which comes with a critique and with this comes a critique of the attempt to found an acentered logical system. If Deleuze's account of the rhizome can be mapped onto Hegel's account of the infinite, then it could be shown also that Deleuze's philosophical approach itself is simply an example of the bad infinite, and that a more faithful attentiveness to the movement of thought would lead us from the, bri the rhizome and the bad infinite to a properly centred notion of the animal form and the good infinite. I now want to show that Deleuze and Guattari are well aware of this possibility, and in fact, A Thousand Plateaus features a tripartite division between images of thought, which allows them to recognise um, the importance of the Hegelian argument while preserving a place for their own rhizomatic vision. So, there are in fact three kinds of conceptual schema that Deleuze and Guattari put forward in A Thousand Plateaus. The first, which is the root book, is the structure exemplified by the arborescent image, whereby determination is provided by a series of subsumptive operations. Deleuze and Guattari suggest two different ways of overcoming this structure, however. These are the model of the fascicular root and the rhizome itself. Fascicular root systems, such as we find in grass, do not have a central taproot from which secondary roots emerge but rather develop a bundle of thin, fibrous roots with no obvious centre. Deleuze and Guattari identify the fascicular root with a certain reaction of modernism against arborescent uh, or linear thought. The three examples they provide are of Burroughs' cut-up poetry, Joyce's attempt to provide the, a decentered narrative, uh, particularly in Finnegan's Wake, and Nietzsche's move to an aphoristic notion of philosophy. Uh, so as an example, in Naked Lunch, Burroughs interjects into the narrative to tell us that you can cut into Naked Lunch at any intersection point. I've written many prefaces. They atrophy and amputate spontaneous, like the little toe amputates in a West African disease confined to the Negro race, and the passing blonde shows her brass ankle as a manicured toe bounces across the club terrace, retrieved and laid at the feet of her Afghan hound. So, in cases such as these, Deleuze and Guattari ask whether, and this is a quote, uh, reflexive spiritual reality does not compensate for this state of things by demanding a more comprehensive secret unity or a more extensive totality. They give three examples of how this unity functions. So, in the case of Burroughs, it's through the fact that the work itself created uh, exists as a unity in its own right. So they, uh, they say the most resolutely fragmented work can also be presented as a total work or magnum opus. For Nietzsche and Joyce, it's in the form of a cyclical ordering. Thus Nietzsche brings in the notion of the eternal return to unify the field of differences, while Joyce, in his most radical attempt to break with linear narrative, Finnegan's Wake, relies on a form of circularity by developing a structure where the final sentence trails off, only to be taken up again at the beginning of the work. So Deleuze and Guattari argue that the lack of an overarching unity uh, is only preserved on the basis of positing a subjective unification in the form of what they call a past or yet to come. Ultimately, therefore, the field of difference relies on an under underlying substratum in these cases. Likewise, the world of differences for Nietzsche is unified by the eternal return. Deleuze and Guattari's relationships with these figures is thus ambivalent, and they say uh, a strange mystification, a book all the more total for being fragmented. 
Deleuze and Guattari are therefore going to attempt to show that despite the recognition of the fragmented nature of the work in modernism, uh, this recognition still in some sense relies on an implicit notion of unity. While arborescent thought leads us to an equivocal ontology with, represent with representation standing opposed to the world, the fascicular thought of modernism tries to break with this ontology by problematizing it, but in fact sets up a problem that demands an equivocal solution. Thus, while the roots do not have a centre, they are unified by their relation to the plant as a whole. In this case, therefore, we can apply Hegel's criticism of the bad infinite. While these thinkers generate a field of differences, ultimately this is only on the basis of an external concept of unity. In these cases, therefore, the subject provides a point of unity in the system, much as the sun is the external point of unity in Hegel's account of plant life. Thus, as Hegel's spurious infinite imminently transforms itself into the good infinite, in the case of the logic of modernism, this is a quote from Deleuze and Guattari, its ostensibly non-hierarchical presentation or statement in fact only admits of a totally hierarchical solution. So they're in fact taking up this notion of the bad infinite from Hegel very, very closely. Deleuze and Guattari's analysis of modernism thus characterises it in a way that resonates strongly with Hegel's criticism of finite thinking. Okay, so this is just a, a brief conclusion. The question thus remains, how do Deleuze and Guattari develop a theory of multiplicity which is not susceptible to this Hegelian critique? Uh, well, they argue that uh, the multiple must be made, not by always adding a dimension, but rather in the simplest of ways by dint of sobriety, with the number of dimensions one always ha one already has, always n minus one. The question is therefore, how do we form a multiplicity without a point of unification? Here we come to the difference, the key difference between Deleuze and Guattari's rhizomatic structures and those of the root book. Rather than the unifications of elements within a substratum, which is the, the notion of a species in the classical model, or a superstratum, as in the case of the sun, as an external reference which unifies the various moments of the plant, uh, Deleuze and Guattari propose that we reconceive the notion of the elements themselves. As long as the plant is conceived of along Hegelian lines as an infinite set of discrete plants, the imminent movement of our image of thought will force us to recognise a necessary point of unity and identify above and uh, unity and identity above and beyond these elements. Thus, we'll be returned to the situation of the subsumptive logic of judgment and the associated structures of good sense and common sense. This is not the place to provide a detailed overview of Deleuze and Guattari's own alternative, but we can start to see the direction this approach will take in the claim that it was a decisive event when the mathematician Rizo, uh, Ryman Rizo, uh, <laughs> uprooted the uh, multiple from its predicative state uh, and made it a noun, multiplicity. It marked the end of dialectics and the beginning of typology and topology of multiplicities. Deleuze and Guattari are thus suggesting here that the move to rhizomatic thought occurs with a shift in the meaning of the term multiplicity. Rather than seeing it adjectivally as something we use to describe various elements, it becomes an entity in its own right. We move from a predicative to a substantive understanding. But this means we no longer talk about the multiple, multiple x, but of multiplicity itself. So Hegel's solution to the problem of the one and the many, the infinite and the finite, is to show how both moments dialectically imply one another. Deleuze and Guattari's response is to recognise that these two concepts are necessarily intertwined, as is shown in the fascicular root model, and therefore to reject both simultaneously. They therefore give up the notion of units of the multiplicity being discrete and closed, and they say there are no points or positions in a rhizome such as those found in a structure tree or root. They also reject the notion of an inherent moment of unity over and above the elements themselves. And they say, the notion of unity appears only when there is a power takeover in the multiplicity by the signifier or a corresponding subjectification. <coughs> 
proceeding. By giving up both moments, they fall outside of the dialectic of the finite and the infinite of Hegel. Uh, there is no determinate being to trigger the dialectical process, but rather what they call an unexact yet rigorous continuous multiplicity. Okay, so final paragraph. Deleuze and Guattari therefore put forward three different models of thought in A Thousand Plateaus. The root book or arborescent model, the fascicular roots or modernist model, and the rhizome or vegetable model. The key result of this tripartite structure is that it allows us to recognise that it's not simply enough to renounce the classical hierarchical form of arborescent thinking to overcome judgment. Deleuze and Guattari argue that we must be careful not merely to reintroduce the moment of identity at a higher level, as they claim occurs in the thought of Burroughs, Nietzsche and Joyce. In this sense, we must be wary of taking too loosely Deleuze's proclamation of a new logic of and, 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 as this is also the slogan of the conjunctive logic of Hegel's spurious infinite. Rather, the rhizome is what they call open and connectable in all dimensions. It's a-centred rather than polycentred. While opposing hierarchy does not do so by recourse to linear series. Okay. So this paper has provided what is a via negativa of rhizomatic thought. It's not the thought of judgment, nor the attempt to incorporate judgment into a movement of infinite thought, which we find in the dialectic. A positive account of rhizomatics would require us to see exactly how Riemann allows us to move from dialectics to topology, and why we naturally believe judgment to provide an adequate understanding of the world. Only with such an account could we truly evaluate Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the riso. Thank you. Thank you.